speaker of the day, Mr. Harsh Mariwala, uh, my colleagues, office bearers, uh, Chetan Shah, Narayan Pasari, Suhas, Sunil, Manish, all the past presidents, uh, senior professionals, young friends, and student friends, welcome everyone to the 68th founding day of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. I'm very happy to welcome you all. We'll begin with a book release, and in fact, two book releases. And I will invite uh, past presidents, Mr. Kanubai Chokshi and Mr. Harish Motiwala, to tell us about the release of these two publications. President, Vice President, all past President of the of, uh, Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, all office bearers of Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. Friends, this is the first release of uh, non-banking financial institution, a treaty. This is under the auspices of Shailesh Kapadia, Mem Foundation, Memorial Foundation publication fund and uh, this is a 27th book published under the foundation in fact Silas family has donated the amount to the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society for publication important publication of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society every year and we since last 27 years publishing one book under the auspices of Shailesh Kapadia Foundation Fund. Shailesh born on 24th December 1949. His schooling was at Gwalior and he became graduate from Sydney College in 1970. Thereafter, he became a chartered accountant in 1974. He did an articleship with Dalal and Shah as well as GM Kapadia. Later on, he became a partner of GM Kapadia and Kapadia and Associates. Shailesh was, uh, I have worked with Shailesh, and uh, today also we feel of uh, his absent. He was a dynamic person and a very pleasant personality. When he speaks to any person, that person would be impressed by his style, his talk, and his knowledge. Shailesh actually was a president of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society in 1982-83. And uh, he arranged the third conference of the BCS uh, very successfully. He had achieved many laurels in his life. I mean, this is not to speak more about the Shailesh, but it is the release of the book. And Shailesh left us in 1988, if I remember it is 19th October 1988. And till also we remember the Shailesh. And Shailesh was always a Shailesh and no one can fill in his gap. With these words, uh, I would request Kanubai to give brief introduction about the book. Thank you, Arizbhai. I'll just first clarify what our Prixit Raman said that uh, this is a book which is published uh, after 18 years. 18 years he referred to that the first publication was released in my presidentship and uh, now I have become major. So I am um, here with the second revised edition. He referred to that 18 years in that context. Anyway, to start with, uh, the Chairman Sir, Honorable Chief Guest, my colleague, ladies and gentlemen. It was way back in the year 1990. 98, the society has published a very monumental publication on non-banking financial companies. This gave a very large comfort design to all practicing bankers, regulators, and NBFC for many years. Over the years, NBFC have continued to play an integral part and contributed to the growth of our financial system. Their abilities to innovate financial products in consonance to the needs of their customer is very well established. 
they continue to be recognized for their role in nation building the role which has been well recognized and strongly advocated for by all the expert committees and task force set up till date both by government of india and reserve bank of india today the sector is passing through a very crucial phase of stiff regulations and very rightly so the rbi has been making all efforts to harmonize with the banks and financial institution and address the regulatory gaps and arbitrage the recent peer to peer lending paper rbi has also been published to state that the technology business are also changing the traditional approaches of lending with this the society thought that a practical view for all of us on various areas on professional updates and a one stop access for various regulations addressing technical challenges accounting and auditing aspect be made available to all so we have today the second and last a revised edition is being published today i am glad to say that this publication has been updated till all the recent announcements of june 2016 and i am told by the authors that the master circular of 1st july 2016 which refers to a new circular of the current year has been in principle taken care by all the i mean correction that has been made before the few days of the release by the authors i also believe that there is no such large publication covering in this sector we therefore at corporate and allied loss committee and accounting and auditing committee are glad to see this edition we would all like to make sincere appreciation to all the authors for their valuable insights and experience it's a very hard work of almost 7 to 8 months by all the authors the authors have retained the high quality standards of bcs and ensuring a practical approach to the subject they were also supported by editorial guidance from very eminent personalities in the field i would now first recognize all the authors who are present over here bhavesh vora who is senior partner at by and associate bhavesh <laughs> zubin bilimoria who is partner of deloitte and currently practices in individual name <laughs> hardik chokshi partner financial services chokshi and chokshi llp <laughs> my partner and the son also selection is by accounting and auditing committee and not by corporate and allied loss committee so i have no conflict of interest <laughs> hanil patel partner audit and assurance shah gupta and company <laughs> gautam shah i believe is traveling partner audit and assurance kimji kumarji and company the authors have been immaculate on their understanding of the subject and had provided this big from users perspective thankful to very special people who had given us the editorial guidance archana manglaguri who is in charge of nbfc at the rbi for many years now she could not make it up but has given the best wishes jayesh gandhi who is present here senior senior partner eny b uh, ranganathan senior vice president edelweiss capital limited and deepak shah vice president edelweiss capital limited rightly said in the president's video presentation by abhay i'll be failing in my duty if i do not recognize the coordination and untiring effort put up by abhay mehta the coordinator of the publication <laughs> i hope this book will shall pave the way for a healthy sharing of knowledge and be useful in guide as said by our dynamic prime minister sabka saath sabka vikas the society recognizes the presence of the family members of late shri shailesh kapriya and are thankful to them for being here i would also request surin to be over here when we release the publication this is a dream publication of the outgoing president raman jogakar he started with his first meeting in the very first meeting with the subject that he spoke about he said it is my dream publication i really appreciate on that with the whatever talk he did book has almost 400 pages and printed in a very special paper by the office bearers and is available for the sale after the release 
May I request all the authors and the contributors, the editors to join over here. May I request our honorable chief guest to be available for the release of this. May I request Harish Bhai, please be here. Thank you all the authors, thank you Chairman, thank you Chief Guest Mr. Mariwala for releasing. 
Friends, each year we have had eminent speakers uh, talk to us on non-technical topics at the founding day. They have spoken about their journey and their learning. My job of introducing the speaker at the 68th founding day, Mr. Harsh Wariwala, is very, very easy because everyone knows him. Most of you must have at some point in time used one of the brands that Merico Limited makes from Safola to Parachute and the ladies would know Kaya. Mr. Mariwala leads Marico Limited as its chairman. He is also the chairman and managing director of Kaya Limited. Over the past three decades, Mr. Mariwala has transformed a traditional commodities driven business into a leading consumer products and services company in beauty and wellness space. From a turnover of about 50 lakhs in 71, Mr. Mariwala has transformed the company to generate a turnover of over 57 billion rupees through its product services that are sold in more than 25 countries. Mr. Mariwala's entrepreneurial drive and passion for innovation enthused him to establish the Marico Innovation Foundation in 2003. Along with an eminent board, Mr. Mariwala drives the foundation to be a catalyst in fueling innovation in India. Mr. Mariwala has launched Ascent, accelerating the scaling up of enterprises to identify growth stage entrepreneurs with potential and enable them in their scaling up journey. He was the president of FIKI in 2011. He has won numerous awards, including India Talent Management Award, Business Leadership Award, Entrepreneur of the Year Award, to name a few. He remains an inspiration to both entrepreneurs and professionals. His journey has been both path-breaking and transformational. We are delighted to have you with us and are grateful for having agreed to come and address us on our 68th founding day. And he will speak on achieving sustainable, profitable growth on a perpetual basis. I request you all to please join me in welcoming Harsh Manival. Before he begins, may I request the president, incoming president Chetan to present a memento as a mark of our appreciation and regard. <laughs> Mr. Marival. So, good evening to all of you. Uh, Raman, other dignitaries on the dais, and ladies and gentlemen. Raman approached me, I think, two or three months back. He said, that, why don't you speak at our function? And I said, I've never spoken to chartered accountants. I've spoken to businessmen, I've spoken to students, I've spoken to corporates, but never chartered accountants. So I was a bit hesitant, I must say, because I, though I've studied accounting, I've, I'm a commerce graduate from Sydney. <laughs> long, long time back. <laughs> never studied, uh, never went in for chartered accountancy because I wanted to enter business and I thought if I spent three or four years in chartered accountancy, if I pass at the first attempt, uh, instead of that I better start my own journey in business. So a very conscious attempt not to, not to get into CA. Uh, many of my colleagues actually, um, after passing commerce, they've become chartered accounts and I was just looking at the the list of past presidents, you know, and I was uh, one of my uh, other colleagues who was with me in school and college in the same class. He was past president of this, though he passed away at a very young age, the lived the last. So, um, so I knew him very well in my school days and college days. Nonetheless, I, I think Raman didn't give up his attempt to persuade me, and he said that you can speak on any subject, need not be an accounting subject. So finally, out a lot of push. I agree to come here. <clears throat> so I hope that at the end of the day you have some take home value from what I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak on business and my own story and what are the key learnings out of this story. So the topic, we again debated a lot in terms of what should be the topic and I must have given him some options, he gave me some options and finally we arrived at this, this option. So I think what 
I'm going to speak about is sustainable growth. How do you achieve sustainable growth in an organization? And it need not be in a business, it could be in a practice also. And I, I think a lot of what I'll speak on will actually help chartered accounts uh, to achieve that sustainable growth uh, if they are managing their own practice or if they are a part of a firm which is in practice. Uh, but before I go into that, I want to know why growth is important. I want to say that because I think growth to me is an oxygen. Uh, in any organization, whether it's a professional like chartered accountancy or a business, it is oxygen. Every organization has to grow every year because if it stops growing, then all the stakeholders which are a part of that organization, which includes the promoters, shareholders in case of business, includes employees. In case of business, it includes associates, which are you work with, key associates. It includes your customers and it also includes the society in general because it creates wealth for all the stakeholders and I think it excites all the stakeholders. If the business does well, then the promoter will be happy, the, sh the employees will be happy, the key associates will be happy. So it's very important for all organizations to drive growth. Uh, and growth has to come precede profits, but over a period of time, it has to result in profits. You can't just pursue growth without profits. And in today's age, I'm finding it difficult for the e-commerce companies which are losing so much money and getting value at fancy valuation. And always that question comes to me, when will they start making profits? And I am I'm not an expert on that, so I'll refrain from talking about e-commerce companies, but I think they are pursuing growth for sure. But hopefully at some stage that growth will turn into profits. So I think that's why I'm saying growth is important. But the growth mindset actually starts at the top. If you are, when I say the top, the top most level and the senior levels in any organization, you have to set the example of a growth mindset in an organization. That means you have to take action which promotes growth. I will give you some examples of what we do in Marico. Uh, and the key challenge is how does that growth mindset filters down all the way to the bottom. For example, if you have an article clerk or if you have some associate who is doing internal audit, he also has to start thinking about growth whenever he does work. And I think that is the key challenge. The start point of growth is at the top, but the biggest challenge for the top is how does it filter down at the bottom. Just to give an example, in a business, uh, in our case, we, we sell our products through our distributors and distributors have their own reps and we have, I, mean, I don't know the numbers, but we'll go thousands of reps roaming around and all over the country selling our products to the trade. Our challenge is how do I motivate those distributor reps, not even my reps, distributor reps to have a growth mindset and if they see an opportunity in the marketplace, how can they encash on that opportunity? And I think that is the key challenge. And how do you ensure that people down the line have that growth mindset so that whenever there is an opportunity, you, you actually drive growth by encashing that opportunity. <clears throat> what do we do in Marico to drive growth and what kind of signals we give from the top? When it comes to a new product launch, we make it very clear that uh, we don't want returns immediately. In our business, the biggest invest investment is in marketing and within marketing, advertising. So there's a very clear direction given that as long as you see a certain growth in that particular brand, which will result in a profit over a period of time, it's okay to lose money over a period of three, four, five years. So we have the patience of losing money, but we should have visibility of that growth turning into profits over a period of time. When we enter a new country on an organic basis, we did that in Bangladesh. For first seven years, we said that let's get growth and let's become very big. And then we will take actions to ensure that it turns profitable. So for first five, seven years, we didn't start with a factory. We started supplying goods from here to Bangladesh. And we were not making enough margin because of import duty. And we knew that if we started making the same product in, in Bangladesh, we would be able to improve our cost structure. So for first five, seven years, all the attention went into actually increasing market share. From virtually a zero percent market share, we, in coconut oil category, we became a 80 percent market share. And um, because we saw that we had certain innovations in place in terms of packaging, in terms of product quality, where we were able to take market share from some other weaker Bangladeshi local players. And if we decided to set up a factory and did it in our own way, it would have delayed the whole thing by 
a few years. So we said that let's just go on getting growth. And then once we got that high market share, then we said, okay, let's now try and look at improving our cost structure, setting up a factory, improving whatever uh, raw material buying in that place. And today we are the largest Indian company in Bangladesh in terms of turnover. It's a very, very profitable company, um, quoted on the Dhaka Stock Exchange, partly because you are getting a lower uh, corporate tax rate there. But what I'm trying to say is that signal had to come from the top that go after growth and don't go after profit. Um, one more example, we started a, a new business, a uh, completely new business which was unrelated to our existing business when we went into the skin clinic business which is a service business and we said, I had said that for 10 years it's okay if you don't make money but we should over a period of time. So we went through a huge learning curve because we, we were not experienced so we made a lot of mistakes in the market and if we had experience in this category we would have turned around much earlier. But one had that persistence because one, one had that confidence that, okay, at some stage it will get a certain critical mass and it will turn profitable. So that's why I'm saying that growth is very important and I think all of us, including all of you, should pursue a strategy of driving growth, not only at your own level, but all the way down to the bottom as level. <clears throat> I'll now go, go back to the time I joined business, very young. I wanted to do an MBA. I was not that bright to get into any MBA school in India. I wanted to go abroad, my father said no. And um, I think those days we were far more obedient as kids. <laughs> so today if I tell my kids, or I told my kids don't go, I mean they will just rebel and they will go. <laughs> but uh, what to do, father saying, okay, respect father. So he said, no, why do you join business? And so I joined that time of family business. I was the first person from the next generation to come in. And the business was managed by my father and my uncles. It was located out of Masjid Bandar. I don't know how many of you have been there. If you've not gone there, please go there just to see what that area means. It's very, very crowded. It's one of the most crowded areas in the world, I think. It has lots of hand carts and trucks and it's, it's in the middle, middle of Godam, you know. So going to the office itself was a big, and parking the cars and all that. Because the business had started off from commodities and then we had gone into industries, you know. So when I started uh, attending office, there was nobody to guide me because it was a completely family manager organization. And we didn't have any professionals. We had my father and my uncle had some family relations, some confidants who were a part of the organization, but there were no professionally chosen persons who were driving the business. Our auditor at that time, I remember, every time you would get a big firing from the auditor, it would take nine months or 12 months because we didn't have good people. And I remember S.V. Gatalia was our auditor and he, the old man would get so angry. <laughs> I know how many of you met him or you met him, but he had, he had a temper, you know, but I'm very capable, but still, you know. And the problem was ours actually because we were delaying and so I wouldn't blame him. So basically I entered an organization which was completely family managed where all the family members were doing things. And there were no basics in terms of uh, organization structure, any systems, even things like an appointment letter or no basic systems also were lacking. And in that, we had three different businesses. We had a chemicals business, which one of my uncles was looking after. We had a spice extracts business, which was located out of um, Kerala. And we had an edible oil business, which was in bulk edible oils, unbranded, mostly unbranded, selling it to biscuit industry, selling it to a paint industry. And I'm not a technical person, so to me, understand a chemical business was difficult. So I said, let me just, I was more passionate about marketing distribution. And I felt that at that time, you know, if I can convert that business from unbranded to branded, uh, that business will become far more profitable, sustainable and we'll be able to drive that business because when you are supplying a commodity like say refined whatever oil to, to a paint industry, the margins are very narrow and so the business was very, very average in terms of returns on capital and things like that. And that's how I started traveling to interior markets. I went personally to parts of Maharashtra, Gujarat, rented a car and started appointing distributors and started retailing products and actually selling the products to the trade. And I still remember those days. I think that excitement and the 
which I got out of selling, I still can't get it, you know, <laughs> because we are, we are doing things personally, you know. So, I think it just exposed me to how to do business. And I was learning from, from experience and nobody had guided me. So, I had to talk to people. I was not able to attract good talent because of the location, Masjid Mandar. Many times, I would call people to, to be interviewed. And they would just run away before they came to the office because to enter that office itself was a big, big challenge, you know. So then I would say, what do I do? So I would call, I changed my approach. I said, let me call them to a Wellington club, you know, where I was just staying next to the Wellington club. So I would call them there, meet them once, twice, convince them what we were doing, that we were going to shift office after some period of time. And then the third meeting, I would call them to the office. And that approach worked, you know. So I think what I'm trying to say as an entrepreneur, you never give up, you know, you have to go on trying different things. And then in an FMCG business, talent plays a very, very important role. So how do I get good quality talent and how can I pay such good quality talent, you know, because talent is, good quality talent is expensive. And there was a resistance to pay very high salaries those days uh, at the family level and more so because the business was small. So I said that, can I work with individual consultants, not consulting firms like, you know, Accenture or McKinsey, but individual consultants. So I identified one friend at, uh, saying that, okay, he was an HR head of a company, saying, can you work with me in the evening and help me set up the HR systems? I identified um, a professor from IIM Ahmedabad, um, saying, can you help me in marketing? And he's a very capable person. But he said, I don't have time, I am fully busy. You, if you want to work with me, you have to come by the evening flight, spend the whole night with me and go back in the morning. So I used to do that. And many times I've gone in the evening, spent the whole night in terms of discussing my all the issues and come back in the morning. So I'm saying that there are ways to overcome those, those bottlenecks you have or certain gaps you have in your journey. And I think if you try hard, you'll, you'll find an answer. <coughs> Um, I'll talk a little bit about Parachute now. Um, so one of the products Parachute Coconut Oil was when we launched in all these markets, we had almost very low market share. And our first steps in terms of improving distribution network took us up to a certain point. So we got market share in the range of about 10, 15, 20 percent depending on the market. So we went to west first and then we went to south and then we went to north and then to east. But we said, how do we break that barrier of 15, 20%? We are, we are stagnating there in, that, in terms of our market share. And we had to find out some newer ways to, to grow. <clears throat> so we said that can we actually, those days the whole market for coconut oil was intense. And we said that if we can actually convert that market from tins to plastic. Uh, it will help us grow our market share because plastics is much, much cheaper than tin. So we'll make more profits and we can invest that profit into marketing. Plastics is more convenient to pour from a consumer point of view. It also looks more attractive than tin. So it, on the paper, it looked very good. We thought that we had a winner on hand and it will be very easy for us to get into the market. But before launching anything, in at least in FMCG business, you, you talk to other stakeholders. So we started talking to the retailers whom we were selling all our parachute. And we went to them and said that we want to launch parachute plastics. And what is your reaction? And there was a vehement negative feedback from them. Because apparently about 10 years before we launched, some other player had launched coconut oil and plastics in square shaped bottle. Not done a good job of packaging with a lot of oil oozing out on the surface of the bottle. And when the retailer closed the shop in the night and opened next morning, all the stock was damaged because apparently rats love coconut oil. They could smell because a lot of oil was coming out and because of the square shape of the bottle, they were very easily able to, the rats were able to grip the bottle easily. So, 
I mean, they were almost saying that forget it, and, but you never give up. If you are convinced, you have to go on trying, as I said earlier. So we went back to the drawing board and we went to our packaging vendor and said that, can you design a bottle which is very, very difficult for the rat to take a grip? And then we went to our packaging department and said that, can you pack bottles so that the rats cannot smell coconut oil which is inside? You know, not a drop should be coming outside. So we did all that, a round shape bottle packed properly in our factories. And we kept the, those bottles in rat cages. So actually we stored for a day or so those bottles and put some rats. And after one day, there was no damage done. So we took a lot of pictures um, of rat cages and the bottles. And with those pictures, we went back to the trade. Said, this is, see, this is what we've done. We are assuring you if there is any damage to the shop, we will pay you money, we'll take back the stock. Not only take back the stock, but if the shop is spoiled, we'll pay you something. And that's how we started beating that resistance from the trade. Um, so initially, very small quantity. And then every month we would go on tracking, you know, what is the percentage of plastic? And we were making like double the margin than in because the plastic cost was much cheaper. So partly we would give something to the, to the consumer, partly to the retailer, and also the extra money we were making, again, with a growth mindset, we said, let's invest and let's get that market share. So, all our effort in terms of converting the product from tin to plastic. So, from a 0% market share, it took almost, I think, 7-8 years for us to convert the whole market from tin to plastics. Uh, and I think because of that, we were able to increase market share from straight away from 20% to 50%. And our sales really increased. So, at one level, innovations in plastics is very basic, you know. But actually, when it comes down to execution, I think you learn that you don't give up, you do inciting, and you go on tracking, you know, every month, as I said, you were tracking what is the plastic contribution. So I think that really helped the brand a lot. Um, over a period of time, we realized that, especially not in Bombay, but north and other colder climates, come winter and coconut oil freezes. So people would go back to tin in winter. So we had to design a container which was a, which was a, uh, round shape container, plastic sh container with a spout, so people would again stop going back to tins in winter. In our sachet segment, again we had a low market share and we said, can we innovate? So during one of the visits to European packaging firm, FAIR, one of our colleagues identified a, a one rupee mini bottle, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it's, it's our answer to sachets. Yeah. And we said, let's launch that, and our, again our market share went up in sachets. Um, so, I think you have to continuously innovate, you just can't stop and say that I've done it, you know. Um, as the brand became popular, uh, in India we have a lot of copycats, lookalikes. So we had a big challenge, we had almost in a survey which was done, uh, amongst all brands, Parachute was the most copied brands amongst all FMC segments. So we said, what do we do? I mean, it's, we can complain to the police, they will raid, but can we take a fundamental structural steps to ensure that it is not copied? So again, went back to our packaging and we designed a bottle which was difficult to copy, which was a combination of a flip top and a pilfer proof cap. And that mold those days cost one mold, was costing about two crores and we required many molds for all our uh, quantities we are packing. So we said that I mean, there are two entry barriers. First of all, it is very expensive mode, so people may just not invest in that. And I think that when we launched that, we again ensured that copycats were out. Though I must say it was a matter of time, Indian mold makers were able to make that mold at one tenth the cost. <laughs> but I think you have to go on playing the game, you know. So a multiple steps in a, at one level of commodity kind of product um, through packaging innovation ensured that we, we became market leaders. And Parachute has become a very, very strong brand. It is what we call our resource generating engine. We sell enormous quantities of Parachute and every month we sell something like four crore bottles, you know. So I think a lot has to do with that growth mindset, innovation in plastic. I'll talk about uh, some other um, what time do I need to finish? 7.15? 7.30? 7.15? Yeah. 
So I'll talk about uh, Sephora, which was positioned as good for the heart. And um, from day one, that positioning is continuing. And it's a niche product in a, in a highly competitive edible oil category. But because we have taken that niche as good for the health, it gives us margins which are much, much higher than the industry margins. And we've stayed on with that positioning ever since we started Sephora. So it's again a strong brand. We created the positioning. And of late, we have launched uh, Sephora Oats. Uh, we launched plain Oats first. And Oats is good for art, so we said that there is a good fit with Sephora. Uh, but we didn't have any differentiator compared to, say, Kellogg's or Quaker. And again, same thing, we were able to get a market share of 15-20% stagnating. 15-20% because the brand is known, we have distribution network. So we said that can we do something discontinuous in the, in the Sephora? range of words. And when we went back to the consumer, um, we realized that Indians love savory breakfast. They don't like sweet breakfast. Like South India, we'll have Italy Sambar, North India, Alu Paratha, things like that. So we said that, can we do what Maggie has done to noodles? Can we do it to words? So we came with a range of savory words, which has, depends on the region. We have three ranges. So South, we have a different set of flavors, and in West, we have, so like tomato flavor, a masala flavor, pepper, pepper and curry flavor, and we launched that product, and that was a new category. This whole uh, business is created, and in that category, that it is over the last two years, we have just created 100 crore category where we are 70% market share in the in the savory oats category. So I'm saying that if you continue to think of how do you differentiate, how do you score over other competitors? Uh, I think you'll find answers, and for that you need to have the right people. I'll talk about that a little later, but um, I think basically what I'm trying to say is that every organization has to, what I call, create a right to win in the marketplace. So that right to win comes out of some pioneering initiative, some innovation, some set of competencies you will have which will make you unique, which will stand out against competition. It could be the best quality manpower you're doing or the best internal audit you're doing or the quickest, whatever. I'm just saying you need to identify what is your business and identify what is your right to win in the marketplace. Um, so it could be a combination of innovation, as I said, pioneering, uh, early mover, uh, or you can identify categories where you have less competition, some emerging category which is, which is coming up. Um, for example, GST is an example, you know, it's coming up. Can I be the prime mover in GST? Can I, so people come to me first, you know? Um, so I think that's what we, if I look back at the history of Marico, I think what we have done is in whatever we are doing, we have created the right to win. And if I look at our turnover, I think almost in 95% of our turnover, we are market leaders. Uh, in some categories, we are number two or number three players. But we have, I think we hope that we will be able to win in those marketplaces. So portfolio choice has played a very, very important role in our journey. So you select a portfolio where you believe you have a right to win through whatever means, through your competencies, pioneering, innovation, whatever. And I think that's, that's my first message I want to give that. I think we have to look, every organization has to create a right to win. The second point I want to talk about is the role of people, and especially in all of your professional, you don't have, even have any other assets. It's the only asset you have is people. Um, in FMCG also, I think people will play a very important role because we are creating brands, we are creating distribution network, we are creating products, and though we own factories, but we do it mainly because of tax reasons. If we are not getting tax breaks in in the in the north and now in Assam and all, I would love to be in a situation where I'm subcontracting everything and concentrate only my effort in sales distribution, product creation, and marketing. And for all that, you need good talent. So the business grew in Bombay oil industry from a 50 lakh base to about 80 crore turnover. And at some stage, I was feeling I was not getting the freedom in the organization to do things which were required to to run an FMCG company in terms of attracting talent, creating the right culture for FMCG. And by then, three, four of my cousins had joined business. I, the location of the office also was coming in the way. Um, 
and even so many family members restricted us to attract good quality talent. And my target was companies like Levers, Procter and Gamble to, to attract talent. So we had to we had to shift this business from Bombay Oil Industries to Marico. And I took about two to three years to convince the family. It was just uh, shifting the business. Not there was no change in ownership, but it was just that this part of the business was shifting into a new company where I would be heading that company and I would be the only person from the family who would manage that company. And that gave me a great opportunity to, to recruit a new team, a team which was required to succeed in the marketplace for FMC products. And Marico started with a very small share capital of 90 lakhs. He took a turnover of 80 crores with a huge debt equity ratio. And we had to select people within a very short period of time. And one of the first persons I appointed was the head of HR. Because if I recruited a good head of human resources, then he would help me sell the story to other people in reputed companies. The name of company was not known, so we had to come out with a campaign. But again, we didn't have money because we had only a share capital and we had just inherited turnover and there was no other reserves. So the brief given to the advertising agency was can you make waves in the job market with just two insertions? So, again, the challenge to ad agency. And I must say, they came up with a brilliant campaign and centering around our brands because ultimately we had to leverage our brands. So, one campaign was one insertion was 200 employees walk out of Bombay Oil Industries in the board. Another was Mass Killer and App, which was leveraging Safola. And third was, I think, leveraging on the Lalita Zion surf. I don't remember the exact headline. So we had two two insertions on the beach, and I think that created a big impact uh, because they were innovative. So realize that when you have limited resources and we have high aspirations, I think that's where innovation happens. You know, because you have huge gap to cover, and you are forced to think differently. You know, you are forced to think innovatively. So with those ads, we recruited something like 30, 40 senior managers. Um, not realizing that when you recruit 40 people from different backgrounds, you know, some people came from Tata, some people came from multinationals, some people came from Asian paints, and each one had come with a different kind of experience and different way of behaving with employees, with associates, with uh, the overall leadership style. So very quickly realized that we had become a melting pot of different cultures. And there was no organization way of doing things. If there was a non-performer, somebody would say that let's sack him. Somebody else would say that no, no, we have to be loyal. Somebody else would say no, no we have to train him. So the organization had to define how the organization is going to deal with people, with products, and with profits. You know, so that led me to write down a lot of the thinking which I developed over a period of time. And I wrote down something like 30, 40 random pages and I shared that with my team. Um, I must say the feedback from my team was very, very positive. Because those days, I'm talking about 1990, 91, very few organizations had looked at values in a very structured manner, you know. So we had long, lengthy discussions with my team and then at the end of those deliberations, over many, many days, we had a document which was, I mean, they also added value to this document, the team. It had a better structure, we divided to people, products, profits. And the biggest learning for me in that was that when you involve people in key organizational initiatives, you get their commitment. You know, if you, I could have said to them, I could have got to a consultant and said that, that please help me finalize the values. They may have come up with the same set of suggestions. But the fact that I involved my team was a very, very important step in getting their ownership, you know. And if I had just conveyed to them, they would have thought it is my values, not their values, you know. And in any value or culture building journey, you need to involve people so they are committed. So then we said that how do we get commitment for the next two layers of management? So we called them to an outside Bombay for two days in a retreat and we told them that this is what we have arrived at and we also want your input. So they again critiqued that document, added value. There were a lot of presentations on what we had given. There were a lot of suggestions also in terms of where are we on these different values, where are the gaps, what do we need to do to, to improve. So at the end of the deliberation, we had almost at very senior levels, 40, 50 people 
saying that these are our values and not not my values or me and my team's values. And I think that's very important. Important that because the involvement leads to commitment. And I think in HR, this is one of the principles that for key organizational initiatives, you need to involve people. Sometimes people think that it is time consuming, but it is worth spending that time because in that culture building journey, if if somebody at the senior level gives a wrong signal down the line, then it will never take place, shape you know, that culture. So finalizing values is relatively easier, I would say. But how do you convert that into a culture is, is far more difficult, I would say. And what do you need to do to create values into culture? I'll just give two or three examples. One of our values is trust. So we make it explicit to all our uh, we don't call our employees employees, we call them members. All our members saying that we trust you. And in lieu of that trust, we expect you to do something. We will, you will be maintaining your own leave records. You will, we will not have any muster. We expect you to come to work. You will not go to your boss for authorizing your spends, whatever you spend in the organization. It could be travel, telephone, whatever. So it is self-authorization. But for all this, we'll do some random audits once in, a, once in a while. And if somebody is caught, then he's asked to go. There is no question at whatever levels. Because we've trusted, and if you betray that trust, then you don't have any reason to be in the organization. And that's going on for the last almost 30 years. And I think that has, I think that has really played a very important role. Even when a new employee comes in, all of a sudden the new employee, oh my god, I don't have to sign a master, I can do things on my own. And it has reduced a lot of bureaucracy within the organization, which is very good. And I think the organization has also benefited. There have been some cases of misuse, but, but it's okay, you know. Um, one other value we have is openness. So we said that how can we ensure that people are open with each other and the organization is open with their members, with the members in terms of whatever we're doing. So we were moving into the new office at that time from Masjid Bandar to Bandra and the brief given to the interior designer was that it should reflect openness. So the designer came up with a plan wherein we were in cabin senior people but they could see each other, it was like transparent, you know. So everybody could see what I was doing. So that was the first signal of openness. Then we, we also have every year what we call the organization communication exercise, where every person is invited at the end of the year at all our locations, including all our factories. So we have something like 25 locations where in the month of May, uh, earlier I used to go to all the locations, but now it's divided because we've grown. In the month of May, some senior person goes and talks about what happened last year in the organization what are our, our plans for next year. So everybody is aware that this is what the organization is going to invest in these brands, whatever it's going to do. And then we follow it up with an open house, which is for about one and a half to two hours, including workmen. So they can ask any awkward questions to management, including questions relating to their salaries, whatever their facilities. For the first few years, we were getting questions relating to all those, you know, basic hygiene factors, as we call it. But last few years, most of the questions are how are we going to fight this competition? So they are more in the area of strategy, even amongst workmen. So I think that uh, I think that it is reinforcing openness. Even we send our our members, uh, senior members, to a six-day training program in leadership style, and again that promotes openness. And basically, we we tell them to be open and have a participative style of management. And if somebody who comes in the organization has a style which is, say, a highly dictatorial style, it will just come out in the organization. So either that person will leave, he will change, or if he's not able to change, he'll leave on his own, you know. So, so what is our culture? We are open, we are trusting. At that time, it was very important to send a signal because we wanted to attract talent from good organization that it is not a family managed organization. It is a completely professional organization. And that meant that if any recommendation came from me or any other family member to, to recruit somebody or to give somebody a distributorship or a vendor, at the most I can say that please evaluate him. The decision is yours. I will not interfere in that. 
so i think meritocracy has a very played a very important role in in sending that signal that it is everything will work on on merits um because we were taking a lot of people and we take on an average about 10 15 management trainees from very good management schools as well as chartered accounts so we we have a very active job rotation plan a person will stay in a job not more than 2 to 3 years um so every 2 to 3 years that person's job will be changed he may go from marketing to sales or from from marketing he may go from one brand to another brand but we believe that this job rotation provides two ways one is you get new thinking number number two the person also learns a lot and builds a career and if you are able to build that career for that person then the person's length of stay in the organization is much 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 more um we also believe that the organization has to promote experimentation so if somebody takes an experiment and fails we should not punish that person because if the moment we punish that person then people will stop experimenting innovation will stop so it's a very clear direction for encouraging people to experiment and we also have in our our earlier said i had mentioned about the organization communication exercise we have innovation awards values awards so we actually recognize people who have innovated within the organization who have practiced our values and they talk about what they did to the larger body and again the whole objective is to reinforce these values from different angles so openness getting reinforced from three different angles trust also getting reinforced so when you reinforce these values on a perpetual basis then you create a strong culture so it's very important to reinforce on a perpetual basis what values you are trying to propound and that's how a strong culture emerges and for last almost 25 years we have had a strong culture the strongest is in our corporate center and relatively it's not as strong when you go out in our factories or out, out of india locations the challenge comes in when you acquire a company and we had many acquisitions in egypt south africa and vietnam it takes time and culture building is a long term it takes 3 to 5 years you can't do it overnight you know uh, the other challenge is when you employ we when you recruit new employees so every person who is newly recruited goes through a values induction program where two days he spends in terms of what are the values and how does that person have to behave so i believe that uh, values and talent has played a very important role um and i think at every opportunity we try and upgrade talent so for example if somebody leaves and we have attrition also because because we have good talent we are to some extent a poaching ground but we what we try to do is when we fill up that vacancy we say that can we recruit a person or can we promote a person who is better than the earlier incumbent so you are basically rising standards raising your standards internally in terms of how are you filling positions and in all that i think the organization's image plays an important role and uh, i think the organization has to create the right employee value proposition uh, so we have created employee value proposition which is centering around empowerment and the culture because we empower our people at much much higher than say a multinational does it because we fight with multinationals in the job market so because multinationals a lot of decisions are taken in in london or wherever the multinationals based um the empowerment given to their employees is much much lower than what we do so we leverage that in the marketplace and you know try to attract talent which is unique to us and i think the key thing for each of you is to how do you attract good talent because if you attract good talent pay them it will just pay you back in terms of uh, returns you know i'll go to the next part which is on i talk a little bit about governance and in different context from day one i had always felt that in those days we had very high level of income tax rates you know i was very clear that we will not do anything which is we, we have to be above board it's okay to pay taxes because one is overall i want to sleep well more importantly if anybody else if some promoter starts doing something in that it will filter down the line to the organization and you don't want that to happen you know so from day one we had very high uh, standards of governance we got some awards also as best governed company and thing like that um luckily in our business we don't have to get any political patronage in terms of a license or something which gives us a competitive advantage so the need to go to delhi was just not there i hardly been to delhi um, except when i became fikki president for my own work and luckily we were able to do so so there no need to generate and to do anything which was payment in cash uh, everything on merits um 
initially when Marigo took over the business, the brands were owned by Bombay Oil Industries and we were paying royalty to Bombay Oil Industries and when we went public in 1996, all the analysts, all the FIS, they said, no, we are not going to invest in your company because tomorrow Bombay Oil just removes the brand and Marigo is a Coca company, you know, you can't do anything. So we said that can we actually, because it's important to create shareholder value. So I was able to convince the promoter that let's transfer this brand at a nominal value. And we indeed did that at some like 20 or 30 crores and the whole objective was not to earn money but uh, give the right signal in the market and I think that really helped us gain shareholder confidence and since then we have taken a lot of steps to improve our investor relations. So our updates, analyst updates are very, very open. We share a lot of information with them. Uh, we had a challenge also that we were perceived to be a commodity company. Coconut oil, safflower oil and people, we were, the multiples we were getting in the capital markets were when we went public, we got a multiple of I think 12 or so. Uh, then it went down to 7 or 8 and others were being quoted at 25, 30, 35 multiple. So how do you go back to the 30, 35 multiple was a big challenge. So one of the things we did was transfer the brands. The other was we said that can we actually show performance which is showing top line and bottom line growth on a quarter to quarter basis which will erase the impression that there is erratic cyclical performance of your results. So almost for 40 quarters we had quarter and quarter like same time earlier uh, year quarter we had top line and bottom line growth and that just erased the impression that we were a commodity companies. And on top of that we improved our overall, we went into value added products and a whole host of steps plus analyst updates, quality of uh, updates, sharing information with analysts. Today we are in the same league as all the FMCG companies including Lever. So we are I think at a multiple of 40 or 45. So but I think it required a concerted effort to, to drive that and you know the governance also played a very important role. Um, the board also, I think board was completely independent. We had, now we have a nine member board out of that, me and one of my cousins on board from family and one managing director and six completely independent directors. So that also gave the right signal. Um, I think as, as promoters we have many times dilemmas in terms of the promoter's interest and the organization's interest. and. Uh, I have one rule that what is good for the organization comes first and what is good for the promoters comes second. So whenever there is a decision to be taken, I just say that is it good for the organization, then we should do that. If it's not good, then we should not do it. So whether uh, it's a weak performer, many people think that some people in the past did very well for us, but at some stage when we became very large, they started, they were not able to perform. And it was load on us, we were, it was impacting our performance. So I decided that it's better to ask them to go. A uh, lot of people didn't like it because they had performed, but do it in a manner which is in a humane manner. Don't ask them to go straight on the road, ask them to go. But tell them that this is not working out, give them three months, six months, one year to, to find some other option. So we don't reward loyalty. I think we just say that because it is not good for the organization. If you loyal people, then you are actually putting that employee first in organization later, you know. But in doing so, you do it in a humane manner. Even my role also, I never thought that I will step down as MD, uh, which I did about two years back. And um, my MD now, who's MD, he came to me saying that uh, he's done well, he's been with me for the last 10, 12 years, saying that I'm getting a lot of offers for uh, heading a company and I like you, I like the company. But I need a road map, you know, I, are you going to promote me or are you going to keep me in the hanging for a few years because you are there? So I discussed that with my board of directors and the board felt that yes, it's important that we retain him. So I stepped down as managing director, I am the chairman now and I spent about 25% of my time on the company and I think he is full time now MD. So I am not, I am day to day basis, I don't decide anything but I am aware of what's happening in the organization. So I'm again saying that I put myself into what is good for the organization because we couldn't have afford to lose him. So we said that that's 
that's a better thing for me to step down compared to him leaving us. So I think these are some of my learnings. And uh, before I sign off, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Ascent, which uh, Raman had introduced. I, this is a new initiative I've started. It's, uh, it's actually an initiative to help entrepreneurs uh, through a peer-to-peer -peer learning platform. So what we do is we invite applications from entrepreneurs. And the reason I'm talking to all of you is that if you, I'm sure you're dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and if my challenge is how do I get more and more entrepreneurs to join the Ascent journey. So we require a minimum turnover of if you are in manufacturing a 5 crore, if you are in services 1 crore, not even 5 crore, 2 crore, 2 and a half crore and 50 lakhs. 2 and a half crores for manufacturing, 50 lakhs if you are in the service industry. Um, and we want them to apply to us. We will go through a selection process because we want to recruit entrepreneurs who are who have that burning desire to succeed and we'll call them to a group discussion and then recruit them and by and large we've seen that we about 50 percent of applications we are selecting that's the roughly the thumb rule um, but we have to be particular in terms of whom we select and today we have uh, about 260 uh, entrepreneurs who are who are associated with us. My target is to have 1,000 in Bombay. This is just now only Bombay based. So, totally today we have about all entrepreneurs and some of the entrepreneurs large ones also adding, giving turnover 600, 800 crores also. Totaling about 15,000 crores turnover, if you aggregate all the entrepreneurs, they're adding turnover to 15,000 crores. So if I'm able to impact their performance and if I'm creating platforms for them to learn from each other, then, as I said, entrepreneurs create wealth for all the stakeholders. So they create wealth for themselves, for their employees, for society. So if I can help entrepreneurs in scaling up, and I realize that scaling up is a different challenge. And many times entrepreneurs are not willing to give up, you know. And if I look back at my own role when I was very young, I was doing things on my own. I was appointing distributors and, you know, sitting with the ad agency and things like that. And when you become a middle-sized company, then you recruit a team and then you start getting things done from others. And the whole ball game changes in terms of your behavior, in terms of team building, processes and all that. And then you become much larger. Like in today's role, my role is to influence. I accept the MD, nobody reports to me. But I get chances of influencing people through talks like this or interactions. So at every stage you have to change. And I realize that most entrepreneurs are not able to change. They're not able to trust somebody else, uh, they're not able to recruit good talent. So I said that if I can actually help them uh, through a peer learning platform, then I would do something. So th there is no fee to this. It's completely whatever is required for managing this is funded by me from personal side. Um, so my personal request to all of you is that if you, if you have anybody, uh, the website, if they want to see www.ascentfoundation.in um, in www is the website and that will have all the details in terms of what we do application form. I'd be very happy if you can help me get more entrepreneurs. As I said, they will benefit. I can assure you they'll benefit and all they have to do is they have to devote some time to this for learning from other entrepreneurs. So they will have to devote three to four hours in a month but I can assure you that's fully worth it. They will benefit a lot. So with that, I'll end my talk. And if there are any questions, uh, most welcome to ask. Thank you. Yeah.
we always feel that FMCG MNCs are greater than us. So, you are an Indian student. Huh? It's a long story. It can take many minutes, but I have nine answers in two minutes. So, actual sugar farms to Mada, then they acquired Tomco, and um, they want to actually buy our Nico. So, they gave us a lot of rumors that Nico is allowed to to give yeah, to us because they were investing a lot in that country. They launched their products once, twice, three, four times. They got some market share, but not at all. And at some stage, we said that uh, we started doing this because they were not very much market share. And I was meeting the leader in a team. I was very positive and negative at that time. And basically, as a buyer, we even designed this as well. So they put the brand on the block, and there was a there was an option where all the other Indian players had paid for the rent, but we were very clear that we had to pay that because it helped us in terms of operating our market share. We paid off the brand to a player like Dabur or Imami or a player. So we had to buy that on. So we actually were very aggressive in terms of paying for the brand. And we didn't give any results. The award said that this is the brand you go all the way. And at the end of the day, if you do that brand, you should not be there. So our fourth was much, much higher than any other player. But we, we didn't regret it. And looking back, it has been the less acquisition today. We acquired that brand in 2006. In 10 years, if I had to sell that brand to that thing, I can sell it for one. Bought it for 150, but I can sell it for the long term to that brand. It's mainly the same thing. So the feeling of the brand was fantastic, you know, because we were actually being targeted as Moving out of them and from there to actually buy from that company was a huge feeling of whatever you call it, tax meditation. So I think it was a lot of other tax
The society has organized the first lecture meeting under the new team on Wednesday, 13 July at this venue by CA P.D. Desai, subject being tax issues in business reorganization, LLPs and companies. There is also a full day workshop on internal financial controls, CARO and fraud reporting on 15 July at MC Gia Hall, Kalagoda, Mumbai. The BCS Foundation runs a right to information clinics which provides help and guidance to citizens for making applications under the RTI Act and also assist in solving any related difficulties on the subject of RTI. The clinic is conducted by RTI activists Mrs. Hima Sambat and Mr. Kamlesh Shah. Venue, Churchgate Chambers Basement, New Marine Lines, Churchgate, Mumbai. The clinic is held every Saturday between 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now the vote of thanks. It is said the strategy is an integrated set of choices that uniquely positions a firm in its industry or even a professional firm so as to create sustainable advantage and superior value relative to the competition. If the goal is sustainable and profitable growth, then there is no easy answers or quick solutions to achieve that. It is only smart choices made repeatedly in response to the changes in the marketplace which will work. Sustainable, profitable growth is the result of a set of many strategic choices made over time and revisited as the market changes. Concerns about whether the business processes employed in the current times can lead to achieving sustainable, profitable growth on a perpetual basis has given rise to a lot of debate. As a dynamic force for change, entrepreneurship is increasingly expected to be focused and dedicated to this goal. Today's talk by Mr. Harsh Mariwala gave an insight on the results of an intensive empirical study a businessman needs to design the business strategy for succeeding in a competitive market. His analysis revealed that it is possible. 
if one has the zeal coupled with entrepreneurial values and motives. The learner speaker of the day, Mr. Mariwala, with his years of experience, has very aptly brought out many of these aspects in his talk on the subject with insight of his medical products, parachutes, safola, and others. Certainly, one-liners he used in his talk are worth recollecting. Growth has come with profits and the mindset starts at the top. Have a learning come always. Continuously innovate. Right to win. Products, people and profits. Trust, openness and empowerment. What is good for the organization? I am sure our members have enriched themselves with this talk. Mr. Harsh Maliwala has taken out time from his busy schedule to speak to our members and has also taken questions from our members. I, on behalf of the Bombay Charter Account Society, thank him and request all present to carry out this vote of thanks with a loud applause. Thank you.